So then the question is, okay, so it's safe. You can do it. It works for conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes. What's actually going on in fasting? Well, some things are obvious. Weight loss, for example, you lose a pound a day. And although that weight loss is made up of fat, visceral fat, protein, water, fiber, and glycogen, we now know from our, our body composition studies that the fat that's lost continues and the lean tissues uh, recover. Uh, naturesis is the selective, uh, selective mobilization and elimination of excess salt from the system. Many people add salt to the foods. They have excess salt in their bodies and that salt causes, because it is it has a, a highly irritating uh, material, which causes the body to retain water and that water increases blood volume, which is why sodium increases risk of hypertension. Also not healing wounds and congestive heart failure and all kinds of other problems. Well, the body selectively gets rid of this excess salt during fasting very quickly. It's a very powerful naturetic effect, actually more powerful even than diuretics that are used. And so as a consequence, the blood volume goes down, the blood pressure comes down, the non-healing wound starts to heal, the congestive heart failure starts to ease, and people start to heal very rapidly. Detoxification occurs during fasting. People are actually toxic. Now, people say, well, wait a second, what do you mean toxic? Well, if you take a fat biopsy of a human, you'll find there's several hundred different chemicals, things like PCB, dioxin, pesticide residues, heavy metals, et cetera. And when you fast, those processes are rapidly mobilized and then eliminated, most of it being processed by the kidneys and being eliminated in the urine. And there's two kinds of toxins, the endogenous toxins, which are you know, normal intermediary products of metabolism, like cholesterol and things that aren't actually poisons, but in too much quantity in the wrong place, they may present a problem. And then there's exogenous toxins that we talked about, like P PCV dioxins, et cetera. Those are rapidly mobilized and eliminated. Now, some people will tell you they're so rapidly mobilized that it would be dangerous, that your body wouldn't be able to process it. And they say that unless you take their proprietary products, their magic pills and potions, then you wouldn't want to do a fast. That's not been our experience at all. The fact is the body is uh, evolved to be able to fast. In fact, all the humans that couldn't fast died. You know, in our evolutionary past, the human brain as being the large bulbous neuronal net that it is, uh, is our biggest burner of glucose. And if you can't fast, that means you could only go about a week where you deplete your protein reserves. Because we can change our brain fuel from burning fat to burning, uh, burning sugar to burning fat, that allows us to preserve our resources. And that's why a, a, a slender human male, 70 kilogram male can fast up to 70 days. Unlike a chimpanzee, which would only last about a week. And that's why you'll never see chimps leaving the uh, tropics where they have a ready supply of year-round food. Because the first time spring came late, all the humans with our large bulbous neuronal net brains, they died. And that's why we call it a biological adaptation because virtually every human has this ability to make this conversion. Enzymes are unnecessary uh, for doing a couple things, mobilizing macronutrients like fat and glycogen and protein. <clears throat> Uh, for example, if you are a trained athlete, you get good at mobilizing glycogenolysis, mobilizing glycogen, because uh, you induce in the, or catalyze these enzyme uh, reactions. Uh, because every time you go out and exercise, you push the system and require mobilization of glycogen stores. Well, you do the same thing when you're fasting. You force the body to mobilize its glycogen stores. You force the body to mobilize its fat stores. Uh, and so those enzyme systems become canalized and uh, are facilitated. And that makes it so that you're able to mobilize fat and glycogen more effectively after fasting, not just during fasting. And the same thing's true with toxins. Toxins are enzymatically isolated, mobilized and eliminated. And so the detoxifying enzyme pathways are induced during fasting and they persist after fasting. And that may be one of the reasons why even intermittent fasting, where you're fasting for a brief period, like 16 hours, Part of the benefit may be inducing these nutrient and toxin mobilizing systems and that day after day after day, you get better and better at it. And certainly with long-term fasting, the effects are very profound and are cumulative. So every time a person does a longer fast, they, they'll be better than they were the last time at uh, mobilizing these pathways. Insulin is a hormone. It drives sugar from the bloodstream into the cells where it's needed to burn. If your insulin doesn't work, uh, your blood sugar levels would rise. And we call that diabetes mellitus. Ty type two diabetics actually make more, not less insulin. It just doesn't work. 
And the part, the reason is people have too much fat in, in general and too much visceral fat in particular. And the big problem is the diet that makes you fat uh, contributes to insulin resistance. So you don't have to lose all the fat to reduce your insulin resistance, but you do have to change the diet. And the moment you change the diet from the highly processed foods and animal foods that dominate most people's diets to a whole plant food SOS free diet, the body begins losing weight. Uh, we know that on average, with moderate activities, males will lose about three pounds a week, females about two pounds a week. Um, men with their higher uh, testosterone levels are basically fat burning machines, whereas women with their high estrogen content are essentially energy conserving fat storage devices, biologically speaking. So that's why it does take a lot more effort for the average woman, um, everything else being able to lose weight compared to the average male. Um, the gut, we've talked about the microbiome already in the gut, the five pounds of organisms that live in this intestinal mucosa. There's a membrane in there that is designed to filter <clears throat> everything that comes into it. So nothing gets through the filter of the gut if it's too large. And it's a, basically a very fine screen that's designed, for example, even a protein molecule is too large to get through the microbiome, uh, intestinal mucosal membrane. It, it would have to be amino acids. Um, it filters bacteria, it filters all kinds of things, except, you know, glucose and protein and nutrients, the things you want to be entering into your bloodstream. And it works very much like a screen works to keep a fly out. If the fly is bigger than the holes, nothing gets through. But the problem is if something damages the screen or damages the intestinal mucosa, then the spaces become bigger and things can leak through. It's termed gut leakage where proteins and bacteria, or other organisms can leak through into your intestinal and stimulate the immune system to have to protect you. But that's okay, because you have an immune system and they'll send in macrophages and they'll surround things and bind things and eat things. And that protects you and does a pretty good job. Except that if you keep doing that day after day after week after month, eventually you can debilitate your immune response or if you're genetically vulnerable, your immune system can become confused and then begin to react not only to these foreign tissues, but begin to react to your own tissues. And that's essentially what autoimmune disease is, where your immune system begins attacking your tissues. And if it attacks your joints, we might call it rheumatoid arthritis. If it attacks your lungs, we might call it asthma. If it attacks your kidneys, maybe it's lupus or your skin, it might be called vasculitis. Lots of different names, same basic process, your immune system being confused, attacking your, immune, your own cells. Now the medical management of these diseases is very powerful. You take drugs like steroids that, or anti-cancer drugs that shut down the immune system. And at first it's like a dream because your symptoms go away. And then it becomes a nightmare because it turns out you need your immune system. And if you shut your immune system down with powerful medications, eventually the effect of the medications may be worse than the effect of the disease itself. And that's why long-term autoimmune disease treatment is kind of a nightmare. Um, so better than suppressing the immune response, what we believe is you wanna get rid of the things that damage the intestinal mucosa and allow for the gut leakage. If you look at this picture, you see that one person has prematurely aged, one image. And that's what we call smoker's face because when people smoke cigarettes, they bathe their body with something called free radicals. And it causes cross-linkaging tissue of collagen tissues. And that's what wrinkles are, is cross-linked collagen tissues that come from free radicals. So when you smoke, you get to get the nice wrinkle to look. If you don't smoke, you age at a more normal rate. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why we talked about smoking helps protect people from lung cancer, because the free radicals cause the animal lining of the vessels to be damaged. And so people have little clots that cause heart attacks and stroke. And that's what kills them before they can develop the lung tumors, which may take a little bit longer to grow. So free radicals from smoking would be one source of free radicals. And they, of course, don't just affect the face. They age your entire body, not just the face, but also the intestinal um, mucosal lining. And so that may be an important part of gut leakage. If so, you could smoke cigarettes, you could drink alcohol because the peroxidation of alcohol also bathes the body with free radicals, which is why drinkers of alcohol get cirrhosis of the liver or fatty liver. Um, there's also viruses like hepatitis, which can lead to that um, as well. Interestingly enough, hepatitis, uh, especially uh, uh, NASH, uh, non-alcoholic uh, hepatitis can also respond uh, to fasting. 
Um, and in part because uh, dealing with this gut leakage issue uh, affects autoimmune diseases all the way down, uh, down the chain. So in fasting, the intestinal mucosa gets to heal. And then of course, after fasting, we want to avoid the smoking, the drinking, the animal foods, the heated fats, uh, the fried foods, the things that give the body this excess uh, uh, exposure to free radicals. And of course, the whole plant food SOS free diet is also a diet rich in antioxidants that help your body kind of neutralize them. We want to be careful though about assuming that because the diet providing antioxidants protects the body that necessarily taking supplements protects the body. For example, vitamin A has powerful antioxidant effects in the form of beta carotene from the diet is highly health promoting, but taking supplemental vitamin A actually can be health compromising. And in most studies that have been done, looking at supplemental of, supplementing vitamin A in terms of treating cancer, the patients supplemented with A die at a higher rate, not a lower rate uh, than the others because um, it, there's a completely different process that goes on when you take vitamin supplements versus getting whole natural food diet. Uh, the sympathetic tone uh, is important as well. The autonomic nervous system in the body controls all the things you don't normally think about. So uh, for example, if you go out running and your heart didn't speed up, you would die because you wouldn't get adequate blood flow, but your heart knows that and automatically speeds up. And what controls that is the autonomic nervous system. It has two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and they have to be in balance with each other. So if the sympathetic tone, for example, is too high, you might have symptoms like constipation. If the parasympathetic tone is too high, you may have symptoms like diarrhea. So the important thing is to get those systems balanced and the most powerful way of balancing the autonomic nervous system that I've ever discovered is fasting. It's like we talked about rebooting the hard drive in a computer. When you fast, the autonomic uh, parasympathetic sympathetic balance tends to become restored. Uh, Psycho-spiritual, you know, isn't it interesting that religions, the Jews, the Jains, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, they don't agree on much. But one thing they do have in common is that fasting can affect both physical and uh, spiritual uh, psychological impact. And so there's a tradition of fasting in virtually every major religion. The immune system is actually enhanced, not suppressed during fasting. And autophagy, which turns out to be a very important process associated with protecting you from disease and cancer. In fact, the Nobel Prize in 2016, uh, Yoshinori Oshumi got for his work on autophagy. And it turns out that fasting is one of the ways of dramatically enhancing autophagy. And then we talked already about taste neurotation, the idea that people get addicted to the artificial stimulation of salt, oil, and sugar. And this is a way of readapting their taste buds so that good foods taste good. So these are many of the mechanisms uh, that we believe are going uh, and taking place during fasting. Uh, and we actually did a study on this last one on taste adaptation, where we uh, determined minimum threshold uh, to salt and sugar, and then saw what happened to the taste uh, perceptions after fasting. And our data showed that a liking of salty, fatty, and sweet, fatty foods changed dramatically as a consequence of fasting, making it much easier to get people uh, to adapt, as our union member did, to a health-promoting diet.